Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching our video cast today. We're super excited because we have Patricia Corey with us, and she's an international acclaimed author, a public speaker, and a thought leader with 13 published books or works in over 22 foreign editions. She's the former host of the popular BBC radio show, Beyond the Matrix. She has been a guest on hundreds of radio TV programs, of course, all over the internet, including CNN, Coast to Coast AM. Her previous book includes The Cosmos of the Soul, Atlantis Rising, No More Secrets, No More Lies, and The Emissary. And of course, I will have her website, which is patriciacorey.com, running across the screen. And, and of course, we're here today to talk about her latest book, which is called Hacking the God Code. And I've got to tell you, folks, I read that book and I'm actually going to reread it because it has a million highlights and it's amazing. It's an amazing read and I highly recommend it. And of course, I'll have the link to that as well. Um, Patricia, thank you so much for being with us here today. We have so many exciting and important things we want to talk to you about. But first, just tell us a little bit more about your backstory and what brought you to write this book today. So just give us like a summary, if you don't mind. Boy, it's, a, it's you know, I'm not young, so it's a long story. <laughs> Basically, I've been a rebel all of my life from childhood, always questioning authority, always looking deeper, trying to get to the root of what's really being presented to me. And it, it, as a healer, as a writer, as a channel through my life, that's been my purpose to get under the surface. And so when this whole debacle, well, we'll go back to the question of the new world order and the whole uh, control human race concept. And then we got hit with two, three years later, we got hit with the health crisis, which we probably don't want to name. And uh, lots of things were being sold to us and I knew that they weren't true. So my question was, and I've always been about DNA in all of my work, it's been about DNA and healing the DNA and understanding the nature of this divine blueprint that was in, is within us and how the scientists and the power structure is intent upon altering the DNA. Mm -hmm. And I realized I needed to talk about this and help people understand it help people to stand up against it and help people to know, as I've been doing for years, how to activate, how to heal, how to restore the, the DNA. So that was behind my realizing I needed to write a book about what if they're after the DNA? What if they're after the, the light within us? What if a structure, governmental body was intent upon taking the light out of the human race, mm. just like they're intent upon blocking the sun from the planet. So Lord. that was, you know, I mean, they're doing a pretty good job of it too, I might add. So that was behind when I, when I decided to do this book, it was a determination to, to face some very difficult questions and to bring forward information that I think is vital for us all. And obviously you have multiple hours and, and, months, years, I don't know, of research that went into that before you wrote it, correct? Well, I wouldn't say years, but, you know, I have, an, uh, let's say, plenty of research, as you saw, to back up some of the uh, concepts in the book, and moreover, so much experience in my life as a teacher, as a healer, as a writer, as a channel, bringing forward system-busting information that helps people think and think outside the box. In fact, my radio show is called, my 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 blog is what do you call it? Blog is called Beyond the Matrix for people who think outside the box. That's what I'm all about. Right. But yes, there's plenty of research there <laughs> because I love to merge science and spirit. So even the skeptical mind can say, well, <laughs> science is right there, though. I can research that and I can get proof of what she's saying. And I think that's important because we need to address both sides of that field. Correct. Now, I was like so taken by your crop circle experiences. Can you just give our listeners a little background as to exactly what happened to you with the crop circles? 
Boy, I wish I knew what exactly happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, I do tell people quite a lot about the fact that uh, in 1996, I was in England. I was taking a course for color healing. And it was a college. It wasn't just a weekend seminar. It was a very solid college with a very tough itinerary. To uh -huh. And I dreamt that I was flying over Stonehenge one night. I dreamt that I was flying over Stonehenge and I heard, and when I looked down, I have very vivid dreams. And when I looked down, I saw this huge spiral in the field, in the farmer's field right next to, crop, to the uh, Stonehenge. And I woke up and I heard a voice, as I was waking up, I heard a voice say, pay close attention. This is a lock on point for interdimensional travel. Interdimensional consciousness. And it's going to be very important to you. Wake up, you have work to do. And I woke up, I went, what is this? And I drew it out. And then that weekend, we took a, a little uh, field trip. We had the weekend off. So some of the women in the course and I went to Glastonbury, which is the mystical Avalon. Mm -hmm. Everything mystical in Glastonbury. And there on the wall was the exact same picture that I had drawn. The exact same size, ratio, et cetera, of Stonehenge and this huge spiral in the field, which turned out to be a crop circle. And when I queried the, the, the um, store's clerk, what is that I'm looking at? She said, oh, it's the latest crop circle. I said, what is a crop circle then? I obviously don't know. And so she spoke to me a little bit about it. And, she, and I told her my dream. She said, wow, you're one of the many uh, mystics that's being called into this crop circle. She said, there's Tibetan monks. There are... Native elders, if you're, you know, you're you're being called, you need to get into it. Mm. And so when I went back to the school, some of the women told the professor about this event, and he looked at me and he said, "You're not here for this course. You need to get into that crop circle, and I'm going to take you." And so wow. he quite generously drove me three hours up to this crop circle. Because I think at the end of the course, we had testing days and I wasn't, it was the day that I wasn't being tested. He said, I'll take you there. And so when I got there to make a long story rather shorter, I was pulled in. I felt somebody pulling, something mm. pulling by the lapels. And I was drawn into the crop circle. I fell in. It's almost as if I was diving in. And once I was on the ground in this middle of this field, in this huge 151 circles. And the one that I fell into was one of the biggest ones like me. And uh, I fell in, I started spinning. I, I looked down at my feet and I saw my feet disappearing, then my legs. I was not terrified, but it was like, I can't even de define the state of consciousness that I was in. It wasn't like a dream state. It wasn't like an altered state. It was just, I saw my body changing from physicality to non-physical consciousness. Mm. And I was taken on a galactic journey that, that, that I would have to call the, the journey of a lifetime, the astral projection, whatever you want to call it, of a lifetime. And in that process, I encountered some six dimensional beings who presented themselves to me as the Syrian high council. And that began a journey of channeling I didn't really want to be a medium. I wasn't that excited about using my psychic skills in that way, but it just kept coming. Book after book after book, 13 books later now. Wow. And so that's kind of my spiritual journey. It's been working with them, working with this consciousness for so many years because the first one came out in 1998, I think, 97 or 98 probably 98 and it first came out and then it was republished later. So yeah, that's my journey. Part of my journey, important part of my journey, at least. But you've had encounters as a child too. I mean, experiences, right. Want to talk about them a little bit too? Yeah. As a kid, I, I used to talk to my mother all the time about the little blue people and she would say, okay, honey, 
And one time I told her at four years old, I told her that I was from another universe, a parallel universe at four, you know, and back in the fifties, which is, <laughs> I was, this was not language that was being bantered. About. Right. So I walked into the kitchen. I told my mother, you know, I'm from another universe. I'm from a parallel reality. Wow. <laughs> I said, well, where are you from, sweetheart? And I said, you're not ready to hear it right now. Obviously you're not ready. So we'll talk about it when you're ready. And I walked back out, leaving my mother just bewildered beyond belief. And how old were you when this encounter happened? Four. Four. Yeah. Wow. Even the language, I'm from a parallel universe. How would you even know that? Yeah. Well, I mean, kids today might know it because it's language that is used. But like, you know, we, we've we evolved to a place where we're talking about multidimensional mm. reality all the time. So kids can, can pick it up, but not then. No, so definitely be, not. Be so, so masterful about it. You know, I can explain to you more when, when you're ready for it, but you're not ready to know that yet. And so very young, my mother said, okay, I know that you're in touch with something that I don't understand. And as long as we keep it between us, we'll be fine with that. But she said, you know, your father will never understand, didn't understand. And so let it be our uh, little our secret, our <laughs> communion, so that we don't, you know, you don't have to worry about anybody trying to stifle it, which was so amazing that she did that, my wonderful mother. So uh, I grew up open, open psychic. I never had to unlearn and learn and unlearn the, the process that children go through. Being told they don't see it. No, you're not. There's nothing there. I was free to, to see it. And I, I was a very clairvoyant child. And I'm still, you know, I've got a powerful psychic faculty, thank God. Wow. Now in your book, you, you know, hacking the God code, you say that we're living like in Armageddon currently, if so, how do you explain or correlate the great awakening? Um, and how, how do you think this veil is lifting so that people are now seeing the truth and being verbal about it and speaking about it, but yet we still have this Armageddon to deal with. How do you see this correlation? What do you think is taking place? Oh, but that's a very good question. Bottom line, the reason why I say we are in Armageddon is because we're in the great battle of darkness and light. And how that relates to the great awakening is the great awakening is the light side of the dilemma and the great reset is the dark side of the dilemma. But nonetheless, this is the battle we're facing. We have the dark forces to determine with the reset, which they're, they're quite powerful, these people. Mm. Mm. pushing forward that agenda and what i love is the harder they push us the more we awaken this it's almost you know sometimes i perceive reality as a big um water balloon the consistency of a water balloon you squeeze here you know a not full water balloon you squeeze here and over here it goes right and so the more they squeeze us the more our side of the water balloon gets bigger and more powerful and uh, more solid Mm. And that is our, that is the Armageddon. I, I don't look at Armageddon as the great battle where you've got the horses of the apocalypse and the whole deal, because I, it's not the biblical meaning that interests me, but rather the idea that we are in uh, the spiritual battle of all time. And I think that earth is under observance by a lot of other beings from, from other galaxies going or other, other realities going, whoa, check this out. Because a, a force is determined to completely destroy. It's not good enough to enslave us. They want to destroy life, all life. And yet they want to retain the planet for their own use. And they want to enslave and manipulate uh, whatever portion of the species that they choose to have remained. What beings do you think are doing this? I mean, if there's so many different species out there, because you hear about the greys, the Aturians, the lizards. I mean, there's so many different like types of alien beings. So who do you think is responsible for wanting our demise? I think we have uh, several beings, species on the planet. Some are underground. And I do think we still, even though some psychics are saying or channels are saying the reptilians are gone and i don't think so mm. 
you know, we have a lot of people taking positions that are just, you know, blanket statements like the reptilians, the Dracos have all gone now. Really? Can we have, how do you know that? Can we have some proof of that? Because I feel that we did, we still have a very strong presence here of the Draco reptilian ET that is commanding at the top of that evil pyramid. And, you know, the child sacrificing, the blood drinking, all of that, it's so reptilian. And so I think we're dealing with that. I, I would agree that they may not be as powerful as they were, but I do think they're powerful. And I also think they're connected to some sort of a AI alien, uh, either technology that's coming in or actually a race of synthetic cyborg type beings that are commanding at a very uh, high level, interfering at a very high level. So, you know, with radiation, with waves, with scalar, with whatever those tools are, the bottom line is it, they're in alliance with that. And these beings intend to turn us into cyborgs. So they wanna create like a slave race basically and use the planet for their- yeah. If you look at how people are enslaved to their cell phones alone. You recognize that in the time that this technology has put in, been put into place, we have lost so much of our humanity. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable because people prefer <clears throat> to be looking into their cell phone in that drugged state. I mean, yeah, the other day I hear, I, I live on this little island and technology is slower to get here than other places. Mm -hmm. Yet a group of four or five young guys sitting having a beer you'd think they'd be talking about football because Portugal got into the semifinals or you know girls or something you know right no they were all glued at this table to their cell phone they weren't communicating at all and they were just ding, 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 ding. and I go this is shocking to me that what's the point of even being in the same space with someone if your priority is yeah to be un disconnected and instead connected to this device yeah it's a big problem you know that is enslavement it's already on the way it's already underway the question but, is how far do they want to take us and the answer right is, what i bring forward in the book is they want to alter us at the dna level they want to insert uh devices that are going to hook us up directly to the computer central is what i call it and own our DNA, alter the DNA to the point that we are controllable at that level. Pretty shocking I, stuff. It, it is shocking stuff. And I, I think we have to use the same tools to fight them back. So as much as like all this technology is working against us, I think there's a lot of people that are actually using the same tools to fight back. Yes. And that's when you started with the question, what about the Great Awakening? As I always tell people, let's un unlock this whole dark thing that we're never, we don't want to talk about it, it's too heavy. And let's look at it because by looking at it, we disarm it. Its tool is fear. The manipulation that comes out of these wayward people or beings is controlling the human race by fear. And they're, they're drunk on the adrenaline force of that, the juice of it, the louche that comes out of our fear and it builds their power. And that wave of energy comes into us and controls us. Mm. So when you're not in fear, when you can openly discuss it and analyze it and consider it, you're already disarming it. Right. It's like disarming it when you put down your phone and say, no, I don't think so. No, I'm not gonna do that. No, I'm not gonna take your drug. No, I'm not going to agree to that. It's like, what, no fear? let us turn it up if you don't do that you won't be able to do this fine take it away yeah that's what they're doing at davos too they're planning their next nightmare <laughs> yeah. so to speak so how do you think it'll play out in terms of um the extraterrestrial involvement because a lot of people say well why don't they save us why don't they rescue us why you know and then you hear some people say, well, just like Star Trek with the law of non-interference and all that. But we've already had beings that have disabled or disarmed nuclear weapons on our planet. 
are these the same beings that you think will like interfere or interject and and step in and say this is where you know do you think that's why we're having so many sightings of these light beings what's your take on that such an important question and it's a very vast field of potential first of all i do think that star trek the original was not i i think roddenberry was either a walk-in or an extraordinary visionary I and agree. that a lot of the information that came to us from the original, I, I, I lost interest with the sequels, but with Captain Kirk, he was my man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that in that original, the law of non-interventionism was presented to us. I think that was presented to us on purpose. I think we were being shown, truly shown information of a galactic nature. And that law of interventionism is such that as I understand it and as I've been told, as long as you're intent upon destroying yourselves, we can't intervene because that will mm -hmm. alter your karma and you're just gonna have to keep doing it again. But if you're, if you're going to destroy the outs beyond your realm, no, then we have the reign, the free reign to come in. So that would explain why the disarming of the nukes. As far as the idea of them leaving us on our own, well, Here's the question. If the human race is in such a state of decline as we're seeing in so many places, so many cities, I mean, the, I am seeing scenes, for example, at the Walmarts where people are just breaking into, sorry to laugh, into this violent insanity. It's right out of a movie. It is. And if that has to play out in the human race, then what exactly should an alien species do? In other words, if we were a captive race of beautifully evolved souls, it'd be one thing. But if we are a mess of people at all, in all different levels of emotional and trauma, a tra emotional imbalance, trauma, rage, etc., what exactly is an alien species supposed to do for us? And would knocking out these reptilians, if that is in fact who's controlling us, would that solve our problem? Let's say tomorrow they, they manage to just disintegrate these WEF and higher folks or beings. We're still left with a mess of a civilization, civilization that doesn't know True. how to act, how to be. So there has to be a huge education, re-education, rebalancing. I think we have to go through all the way through this struggle to get to the other side on our own. And as scary as that is, I think a lot of people are going to perish. Mm. I think that this is part of the evolutionary cycle we're in where some people have chosen to go completely to the dark side. It's not just on top. So, you know, a lot of people are feeling victimized by this leadership, quote unquote. <clears throat> and my question is, what about the people that are opting out for drugs and violence and rage? What about them? What about their contribution to the overall social structure? And they're being targeted too. They're, you know, they're, they're, by flipping everything on its head in terms of like our, our morality, um, by saying that red is not red, it's really blue, and, and, and changing our mindset on our moral values, you know, it's like they know exactly what to do and when to do it, these corruptors. Yeah. And, and they're targeting these, these. Sorry. That's okay. Go right ahead. Something has to happen that we don't stand for it anymore. So the great awakening idea is wonderful. People are starting to recognize it. Okay, then what? Because just recognizing the problem isn't gonna solve the problem. So we need to move from, and this is our process and I believe no, no alien species can help us through this. We have to move from waking up to recognizing what's going on in our world to correcting ourselves, the people we love, we're not going to correct anyone else, but you know what I'm saying? Influencing change for the better. And then 
healing our society. <laughs> so we've got the individual healing to do, the societal levels, the global civilization, because we need to save civilization here. And that's what I mean about Armageddon. This is no longer a personal existential problem. I mean, 20 years ago, people were talking about, my boyfriend doesn't love me. And now we're talking about what is the purpose and meaning of life. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, this is part of this huge ascension process, if you really yeah. think about it. And, and I feel blessed to be able to witness it. Like, I don't look at it as a, as a curse. I look at it as a blessing that we're able to be here to play our role in you know, lifting this veil. So <laughs> you made a great point. So uh, you said that, that there's a lot of healing that needs to take place, that people, you know, in terms of discovering the truth, they also need to heal themselves within. So how do you think that happens? Do you think people like are now seeing what's happening and they're having this internal healing taking place at the same time? I think so. You know, I've been a healer all my life. I've dealt with all kinds of <coughs> And I've always told them, it's when you start to pull stuff out of the subconscious and into your consciousness and facing that pain that you start to heal. And so that when people would come to me on Prozac, I would have them get up back in the, I'm talking back when I had my life work center and I actually did person-to-person uh, -person healing. I'd have them get it up and they'd get angry. What do you mean get up? I'd say, I can't work with you if you're taking frozen. Mm. It's numbing you. And it means I don't want to face my pain. So hands off. <laughs> so now we're facing our pain as a civilization. People are, are confronted with deeply existential issues. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life on earth? Are we going to be ever recognized as part of the galactic civilization of beings? I mean, we're, we're really progressing into a, a much higher state of being, despite what it looks like, which is it looks like we're degressing into total chaos. But that is one segment of our society, one segment of civilization. The other segment, which is growing, and you know, it's like, like I said, the water balloon. Mm. That the it it just keeps shifting back and forth, but a big part of our civilization, a growing part I should say, is starting to say no. We won't shut down our farms. No, I'm not going to take your poison, and that is a huge, huge statement of healing because to be able to say clearly, no, I am a sovereign being. I will not adhere or whatever form that takes of, of establishing what you truly believe in and what is right for you and what contributes to the greater whole. For me, this is healing. Mm. Do you think though, because the cover up is so global and you know, you've got the media, you've got governments all over the country, they're all like in on it. And do you think that's because of power and money or do you think there's some other like, covert reason why like because w when i had my awakening years ago and realized that the government is not my friend <laughs> let's put it that way um it, it was very damaging because you know we're, we're taught to love our country and trust our government um do you think it's just about money and power or do you think there's something deeper going on in terms of their involvement because now you got the wef which, you know, when I talked about them years ago, everybody was like, oh, that's conspiracy theory. And now it's like they're right out there. It's like, here's, here's, you know, all of it. And we're just dumping it all on you at once. Where did this bodaciousness come from? Like, I uh, really believe, I don't know how you feel about this, but I, I really believe there's a satanic force at play mm. and that it has been covert for a long time example, subliminal ads, subliminal, subliminal images that have been put in advertising and programs or whatever programs that are now out in your face. Like look at Balenciaga. Look at Balenciaga. Look at all of it. They're just out and they're, and they're in force. And they're out there. You know, like for example, even, even the uh, invent of 
videos for, for pop music. Before they had the video attached to it, the music had less impact to, to portray mm. or implant a concept or a, or a mindset. But now they're playing out all this ritual all the time. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. I look at some of it and go, I can't believe I'm seeing this and nobody's reacting. So- that's, so, that's so true, Patricia. And such a great point because um, I remember when I learned that uh, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin was this like huge satanic follower. And, you know, back then there weren't really music videos that that there were like in the 80s and 90s. and it's just out there in your face now. They, they're like proud of it with all the satanic symbolism. So regardless of how folks feel about religion, um, there is this evil force out there. Well, I have to, re- I've got to write something down because I don't want to forget what, what I want to say about that. Go right ahead. Um, all right. Well, Bob Dylan, I don't know if you've seen the interview. I did. Okay. That's it. What are you doing? You know, how do you explain how you're still up, you know, still doing it? Well, uh, I signed in a group. I signed, I made a pact. Yeah, he said it. My, uh, my end of the deal. And the interviewer says, What kind of deal was that? And he says, Well, you know, deal that, you know, the major, I don't know how he says it. He says, Who'd you make the deal with? And he says, Well, you know, the commander of things you see and he- things you don't see. And I have to live up to the deal. I'm like, whoa, okay, spelling it out here. And so this has been, you know, impregnating all of the music industry and mm. entertainment industry. And a lot of them openly talk about this deal, the blood signing, whatever. But now we have a force. This is out of this covert deal making concept and the inserting of nuance in artwork and in in messaging. Now it's overt, it's in your face, complete, total satanic statues everywhere and and, you know, appearing everywhere, satanic school groups after school, they're indoctrinating the children. And so this is a force to be dealt with. And I think that religion also has its flaws. There are there are also so many <laughs> Catholic Church mm. with all the that have been paid off because of their behavior. I don't think there's a perfect solution here. The only thing that I can understand personally is I'm not going to find answers in the church. I'm certainly not going to find answers in the satanic movement. I'm going to find them within me. I'm the one. I'm the commander of this ship. And my spirituality, speaking just for me now, is direct. I don't need anybody to interpret it. My contact with spirit is, and my creator is direct. And I think that this is something that is that people are experiencing more and more now. And that our spirituality, the movement or the organizations that call themselves spirit groups, ascension groups or whatever, are people recognizing that the answer is within them. They've got to find the answer within them. And that is that they are beings of God creation. They don't have to choose that side. So I'm talking about the side that, that chooses the light. That they are beings of light. That the DNA within them is a divine blueprint. It cannot and must not be altered. It must not be altered. Hence the title of the book, Hacking the God Code, Hmm. Conspiracy to Steal the Human Soul. Because I believe that this force that's destroying society, that's orchestrating the destruction of society, wants more. They don't want just to kill us off. They want the soul, just like they wanted the soul of who signed that contract in blood. They want the soul of every individual on this planet. And that means you have to give yourself away to it. You have to allow that darkness in and i think that's what we're dealing with now so people are making dramatic choices even if they don't recognize it they're making dramatic choices by saying no i'm not going to allow you to do that to me no i'm going to i'm not going to bow down to the fear and yes i know i'm a divine being i know i'm a sovereign being i am the commander of my being i am love i am light. and i don't take these words lightly at all yeah um 
gosh, I had so many questions in my head just now. Let's talk about DNA. Um, I did see a video where they actually were able to read the code of DNA and it was God's message. I forget exactly what it said, but that like blew me away. Um, why do you think that people are so willing to give away their DNA? There's so many instances of it, like with the ancestry stuff, just spitting a cup. And I mean, you know, when that first came out, my family participated in that and asked me if I, and I immediately was like, no, thank you. But they thought it was the greatest thing ever. And millions of other people too, just to give away a piece of you. And God knows what they, they do with it. You know, God knows what kind of experiments they're using your DNA for. Well, we know that more than God knows about it because we know that most of that DNA is ending up in the Chinese laboratories. Right. And so, uh, some of my family did the same thing. And I said, thank you for giving away my DNA. Yeah, which is true. Papers, right. But the, the, the problem with this ancestry thing, it, people even paid for this. Yes. yes. And I have a real hard time understanding why people don't question these things. It's like all of a sudden everybody wants your DNA. Oh, you let you know you're Italian. Thank you. I already knew that. Don't need for you to have a swab of my being. And you know, I've been called a conspiracy theorist all my life, so I have no problem recognizing that this was going to get me into conspiracy territory. But why do they want the DNA? What are they doing with it? Answer, they're altering it. They're making chimeras in laboratories. They're now right. working, you know, they're making chimera just what they're admitting. Camara humans with pigs for spare parts. I've seen those videos. It's too horrible. An abomination. And they love it because it is the abomination of the divinity within us. Yep. Turning us into animal aberrations is very entertaining for them. Destroying the purity of the human being. Remember, you've all. Noel, you, you Noel, you've you, Harara, Harara, some awful we, name. <laughs> human beings are hackable animals. Yes. He goes, this thing about the whole, you know, it's so much disdain. And I, you know, I'm watching this man going, I'm again, I can't believe I'm hearing. This. Yeah. This thing about the soul and God and immortality, that's over. Yes. He said that's over. Like, I heard him. I went. Excuse me, it's not over for me. Hello. We have the technology. We're going to make a better human being. We're going to make a human 2.0 that's connected to AI. You can, you know, you'll be better. You, you don't have to mess around with this God thing, this illusion, delusion. I'm like, well, they're going for the gusto, these individuals. Oh, yeah. They really I mean, even them. even with the with the swab up the nose, um, we have to be careful about verbiage here but you know what i'm talking about millions of people went and just and and that test was so dangerous too i've heard of brain punctures like the ceiling between you you know i saw a video of a woman that was uh, she had gone blind oh the, the uh, blood brain barrier right and uh so her, she went blind first because she was bleeding out or fluids were leaking and then she had a brain hemorrhage and died and i'm sure that happened dozens if not so many times and we never heard about it if you watch the people lining up to get this test or the ultimate insanity to me insanity to me is the drive-in where mm. you've got somebody who don't have any clue what their what their medical none is. you you drive in you stick your head out and they stick this thing up your nose and people don't get that this is absolutely insanely invasive Side. And the cycles were increased beyond the point of necessity, uh, making it positive more times than who who knows? Because the creator of that says that you couldn't use it to test that anyway. It wasn't designed for that it purpose. Has no purpose for right diagnostic anything. And right. It's like, well, why are we doing it? Well. You know, I know we have to be careful what we say. But right. And then he mysteriously died. So, like, I, I don't know. Yeah, he died 
the creator of the C test. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, he mysteriously died uh, right after he became verbal about it. If you go look at some of the videos, which to me was so cryptic and like right out there, these 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 lizards have no problem, you know, doing these things. And this yeah. is why I'll tell you what I really put my proverbial ass on the line doing this book because I knew it was going to let's say, put me in a position that I'd rather not have been in. But, you know, my message for people is fearlessness. My message is face the fear and do it anyway. So I said, well, okay, then <laughs> let's get this book out. Oh, I'm so glad you wrote it. I, like I said, it, 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 I have to read it again because as I'm highlighting, I, you know, I want things to sink in and I'm like, well, I'll go back and read that again after I'm done. It was just such an excellent read. Um, Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. What do you, what's your take on the, on the WEF? Like, let's look at it globally. So their mission is to like own our souls or, or turn us into hackable, you know, humans. I guess we wouldn't be called humans at that point. Uh, They're actually coined the anagram GMA. GMH, genetically modified humans. They're already using that. Yeah, he came out, Klaus Schwab, and said that we wouldn't be human. And I heard it in a video where he said, we wouldn't be human anymore. We we would be better than human. They, that's how they like to put it, that we're better than human. No soul. You know, get no soul. soul idea. Yeah. And so in order to get rid of the soul, in my thesis, in order to accomplish what they want to do, because as long as we do have a soul, they're never going to be able to take the whole the whole human race out, right? As long as people like you and me are saying, no, I don't think so. Whatever you dump on me, no, I don't think so. I'm a sovereign being. So if they can get in there and hack out the God code, which I understand in the thesis in the book is that the creator, the prime creator, call it God, call it whatever you want, the prime creator that put together this puzzle called all life on this planet had to have, sig he, he, he put his signature, his, her, its signature in the code. This DNA code is so complex. And my understanding is that that signature is Yahweh. And, you know, in the Bible, it, it says, what is it? The, 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 uh, you never take the name of your, the Lord, your, your God in vain. Never take the name of the, the Lord, thy God in vain. in vain. But if the older text, as I describe in the book, it translates into never misuse. Mm. Of the, and so the misuse of the word Yahweh would be more in line with the idea that this, if this code could be deciphered where this Yahweh is in the DNA code, then it could be possibly clipped out. And with CRISPR, which again- CRISPR, I, I was just gonna ask you about that. CRISPR Cas can, can you explain to our listeners what CRISPR is? CRISPR-Cas9 is a relatively new software technology that allows even your, your relatively underfunded genetics lab to go in to identify exactly a piece segment of the genetic material or code that they want to slice out. And just like that, they can go in, flip out a piece of the DNA and either repair, quote unquote, replace it, re whatever. And that's what they're doing when they're combining animal DNA. I believe they're working with insect DNA. They want us to be insects so bad. Oh, I'm sure. Really bad. <laughs> and, you know, cloning and all of these other horrific things that are going on. But what if by clipping, what if they have been able to identify what that God code is? Where, you know, how that is identifiable it remains to be understood. But if they can clip out that light, that the, the, the vibrational light that would be the name Yahweh and replace it with, let's say, 666. Again, I'm talking about the vibrational aspect of the number or the sound because we have to relate sound to this question. 
So, you know, people said, you mean the number 666? I'm talking about the frequency of it. And if they can somehow code that in, holy magoli. And I think that's what they're doing. I think that's what they're intent on doing. I've had, I've had some people ask, why is God allowing this? Why is the creator allowing this to happen? Why is he allowing our DNA to be hackable? You know, I wish I had an answer for that. I mean, I don't understand why we have to suffer so much. But the only answer I can come up with is because each of us has to make those choices, darkness or light. So free will, essentially? Yeah. And some people will go to the darkness by choice, and that's going to swing them way back down into the pit of the, let's say, re reincarnational spiral, because I don't think it's a wheel. I think it's a spiral. So they're going to go way down back to have to crawl back out of the muck. And some people are doing it innocently, but they're still giving away their power. Yeah. So when you say yes and roll up your sleeve or yes um, to the many other ways you can be infiltrated or mm -hmm. yes to the fear. Okay. Okay. Just tell me what you want me to. I was taught that my government might. Yes to that, you are giving yourself to it. And so perhaps, because I can't speak to what God or creator has in store for the human race, but perhaps it's for us to make the choices of souls ascending. And if we don't, that's okay. We can just go, go do this over again. That's the best thing I can possibly make out of why a benevolent God creator would allow so much pain um it's one of those unanswerable questions isn't it it is but you know I, I think we can all agree that it's been through pain and suffering that we learn our greatest lessons too absolutely and you know like the syrian high council said did you think this was going to be easy excuse me did you think ascending out of density was going to be a walk in the park you have to go as a species, you have to go through the fourth, which is heavy duty. And, you know, the fourth dimension is represented in a lot of religions. It's in the, in the Duat, in the Egyptian text, mm -hmm. in uh, Dante's Inferno, mm -hmm. Tibetan. All uh, the Catholics have the, what do they call it, purgatory. In many religions. Well, they got rid of that, though. <laughs> oh, have they? Yeah, the Catholics got rid of purgatory. That's convenient. <laughs> That's what I said. But you know, it, it's. I think that the fourth dimension is per, is a sort of purgatory where right. we, before we get to move up, we have to face our karma. We have to face the society, societal karma, civilization karma, and our own all together. And that's what we're doing because the veil is thinning, and so all of this debris karmic debris is bubbling up to the surface and we have to deal with it war non-stop rage hatred perversity and incredible people rising up let's not forget there's a light side to this people awakening people recognizing that there's more than just this illusion of life and the material reality there's more and it's that searching for spirit that reaching out to creation mm -hmm. that is the ultimate ascension. You know, I, I heard a quote the other day that blew me away. Um, the battle for the soul is being fought in our healthcare system. Very true. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, the mRNA is another question for another day. They're going to put that into everything. That's the new, somebody told me, that's in the medical profession. She said, well, you better get used to it, to Patricia, because that's the new medicine. I said, well, it's not for me. My medicine yeah. is Manuka honey, babe. And God, oil yeah. milk. But, but now yeah. they're injecting our, our livestock with, with this and, and mosquitoes that they're releasing, you know, yeah. that uh, Mr. Uh, Gates there is releasing into, you know, countries all over the globe. So I, I think it's, huh? They're diabolical. Yeah, they, I mean, I, how is this not going to affect us? 
on a DNA level. If this is so prevalent and they want to inject livestock, if they are, I'm sure they are already, um, because I, I've seen animals having seizures now, so which is just terrible. Walking in circles. Did you see that whole thing? The lion. I, I the lion. I saw the animals walking in circles, and I'd love to talk about that because sure. I'm watching this. You know, when the animals start freaking out, we're in trouble. Yep. So all of a sudden, all over the world, animals are just walking aimlessly around in circles. <clears throat> I'm not understanding, is this, there are many possibilities. One could be that they're being controlled by some demonic force because, you know, CERN is opening up all kinds of lower astral oh, yeah. entities to come in. I mean, it could be a 5G thing too, who knows? 5G thing, which is a very big possibility. And it could also be a polar shift question because everything is shifting. Other planets are shifting too. The sun is going berserk. We're in a huge, huge shift. And it's galactic. It's celestial. It's personal. It's societal. It's going from into the age of Aquarius. It's the fact that we're in the photon belt. I mean, there's, it's just change time. And my perception is it's going to be very painful until mm. it's not. Right. And how we decide to deal with that pain and what choices we make, for example, I'm a vegetarian. And so, you know, perhaps this question of the meat, maybe it's time for people to start looking at that alternative, making as yeah. best as possible choices. They want to take away, away the meat anyway. It's all too much. It really is. Yeah. I mean, they're doing it to our fruits and vegetables too. So I, I don't think we're safe on any level. Um and then you've got the whole shedding thing to, you know. But mm. let us not forget mind over matter. My mantra every day is, I do not intend to suffer one moment. Mm. I say it when I get up. I say it when I go to bed. I love and that. I do not intend to suffer one moment. So if I'm going to die, we don't like to use that word. We have to use the word pass. <laughs> Die seems to have become a very ugly word. So, but I use it because that's what it is. Exactly. If I'm going to die, fine. I'll die. Whether I die when I'm 90 or now doesn't matter to me that much. So I have no fear attached to it, but I don't intend to suffer. So I've already made a deal with the universe and said, look, if it's time for me to go, make it switch. Right. Right. And it, I just feel comfortable with that. I don't intend to suffer one moment. I've made some very good choices. I live on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The air is pretty pure. I don't eat meat. You know, I'm. you do your be very best. It can't be fear-based or they got you. And so I believe that even poisons that are coming in can't, uh, can't completely alter you if you are running this powerful, energy i do not intend to suffer one moment so you think you can mitigate all this stuff by by your thinking by aligning proper thinking i really do and intention and i also think that they're they're telling us it's they're doing more than they're doing because they need the loosh of our fear so it's like oh the mosquitoes or oh, today it's something because they love it. They're like, <laughs> today. They love really it. are. They love it. And they're doing this video in their reality, like, you know, the, the mad doctor. No, today we'll launch mosquitoes. It's just comical if you really think it is it. comical. I mean, look at Al Gore's speech at Davos with the boiling ocean water and the whole thing. Yeah. And he said, we have to raise. More money, more climate funding. It's like, and how much is going into your wallet today, sir? As they all flew in on private jets and eat caviar and lobster. And look at this and, and remind ourselves that this agenda is, is ultimately orchestrated and what fuels them. We've got to remember this. I'm all about this. And so is my book. If you allow yourself to get into fear and despair, they've got you. And I refuse. I refuse to get into fear. And I also 
don't intend to suffer one moment. Now, am I, am I willing to suffer emotions about other things? Of course, I'm talking about survival, the, the ultimate uh, existential question of life, I'm not willing to suffer. Take me out, if it's time to go, I'm out of here. Because also I've had two near death experiences. I know we don't die. And when I say it, I say it emphatically. I know only because I know for me, because I've been on the other side of this tableau and uh, I've been wow. in that divine light and I know what awaits. Would and you be comfortable I, talking a little bit about your, your NDEs? I mean, yeah, the, the, the one that really is the most important. I was, <coughs> I was 17 years old. I was climbing the cliffs at Davenport Beach in California, where I used to go and write poetry on the rock, sit on the rocks and write poetry, and the tide came in, and I was distracted. And to get to where I used to go, there was a little, uh, a, a, an inlet, a big mm -hmm. rocky cliff, then this inlet, and then more rocky cliff. And I'd go up on top of these rocky cliffs and watch the ocean and just be one of the guru. And so this one day I was there too long and the tide came in. And when I realized it, I went, oh my God, I gotta get out of here. Because the other side of the cliff, was death and where I came from now was smashing waves, no more inlet, no more sand, huge waves coming in. And I looked at it and I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna die here. And I, for some reason I didn't panic, <clears throat> but I just went, I've got to get to the other side of this. How am I gonna do this? And so I tried to figure that the wave, I would catch it when the waves went back out, I'd make a run for it and get to this other cliff. Well, I made a run for it, the wave grabbed me. And I, I do remember that as I grabbed this cliff, the slivers of rock went up my fingernails. Ugh. Took a big, <gasps> and got sucked out into the ocean. I saw myself in a tomb. There were dolphins in this surrounding me. I was swimming. I wasn't swimming, I was just propelled in this tube, which is described in my book, The Emissary. And, um, then I was just in, boom, I was in this extraordinary love. There, the, there are no words. And I think a lot of people that have had near-death experiences have the same expression. There are no words to describe what that feels like. It is ultimate love, light, blessing, bliss. It's bliss, ultimate bliss. And, and I was surrounded by dolphins. And uh, then I heard a voice say, you can't stay here. You need to go back. Mm, which is a common theme. And I go, oh, no, no, I want to be here. And I saw my mother's face. I adored my mother. And the voice said, you can't leave your mother now. Next thing I remember, I was on this cliff that I was trying to get to. My body was covered in blood and my face was cut up. And I was looking, I looked up. And there was a man giving me mouth to mouth. Wow. And, and I blinked and he was beautiful. He had blue eyes, beautiful eyes. And I just remember looking in those eyes, like I'm gonna be okay. Mouth to mouth, I turned over, I, I rejected all this water. And when I looked back, he was gone. <sighs> and there was nobody for miles. I mean, I could look all the way down each side of me. There was no human. Wow. Being. So I knew that it was an angel. And Definitely. I mean, these, are, these are things you can't explain. I mean, an angel giving mouth to mouth, come on. But that is what I remembered and recalled. And it dramatically set my course in life. I mean, come on. It dramatically said to me, we don't die. And you are protected. And that carries me in my life through everything. I know that I don't die. We don't die. And I know that I'm divinely protected and we have angels all around us. Mm -hmm. And that's not being airy fairy. I have proof of it. I mean, that moment, cause you know, when I finally worked my way back to reality and got in my mm -hmm. car and saw my face, it was all cut up. And I was like, how did I get onto that rock? So you have no memory of getting back on the rock. No, I just was there. And you know, the thing is that we, the, the logical mind searches for a logical answer. Mm. So as I was going through this process, I thought, 
Uh, maybe the, the waves threw me back up. Maybe this, maybe that. All I know is from death, I was returned to life, placed on that rock somehow, whether it was the ocean waves throwing me back or whether there was divine intervention, but there was that angel. It's, you know. And you had a second experience as well. Yeah, the second one was also drowning. I was with my mother and we were playing in a swimming pool and uh, I was on her back and she was swimming and she was going down and I, and I didn't understand, I was a kid. And uh, she finally threw me off and I started to go down. I was a child. And um, I don't know if that was exactly a near death experience but it was facing my mortality for sure. And so the bottom line is that it's a real gift to have a near-death experience. Mm. It's, it's an extraordinary thing because you get to, to know for absolute certainty in your, in your consciousness that death is an illusion. And I well, why do you I, think some, some people remember them so vividly while others could have passed away for five minutes and come back and have no memory? I can't answer that. I, I, I can't answer that. All I can say is that the fortunate are the ones who remember. Yeah, who come back with the memory because it is life altering. It is. And some people come back speaking different languages and with different. No. Skills. You know, it, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. I wish everybody could have one near death experience. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Because so, it would define one's understanding of life and mortality. So do you think that was responsible for like removing your fear of death after that incident? Did you have no longer fear of death? Yeah. Absolutely. Because the, the feeling that you come away from, if it's like mm. mine is I kind of want to go. Mm. And now my mother, who is my soulmate, since she passed away, I'm kind of, I always say to people, well, my mother's waiting for me on the other side with the espresso coffee. So, you know, I I'm curious. I love this life. I've had a very good life. I still do, but I'm ready. If time, people always say, don't say that. <laughs> we want you here. But if it were time to go, I just ask that it be swift. Let there be no suffering. Yeah. Let me get to the other side, see what's going on over there. <laughs> And that, you know, if people just start to look at, at this, this question of our mortality is what we're being thrust into all the time. You're gonna, the bombs, the nuclear, the starving. And we need to start thinking about our immortality because in the end, we are immortal souls and that's what they wanna take away from us. And that's what we're not gonna let them do. What do you think the most powerful thing we can do to fight back is, I mean, other than not buying into the whole saying no, you know, and taking your personal stance, because I, I've realized too, that you can't wake other people up. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so, but I feel it's, it's, it's imperative to share what you know and what you see to be true as well, so that you can help people wake up. Aside from that, what do you think the most powerful thing we could do to protect our DNA, to share our knowledge about what we know to be true with other people? I think the most important thing to do to protect the DNA is to understand it, to, to work in the book I offer uh, possibilities on how to activate and, and work with sound to heal our own DNA, to fortify the DNA and to understand that it is a divine blueprint. You don't want to give it away. You don't want interference with that divine wisdom. And for the rest, what we can do, be a lighthouse. Mm. When people walk away from you, let them feel, be a symbol for what you believe in and walk it so that people can look to it and say, well, I, I can feel that love. I can feel that power instead of trying to bombard people with theory because theory you know if you're not ready to hear it you're not going to hear it but when you're with when you, i'm sure you know the feeling of being with someone that just 
represents what they say, represents light, love, and gives you a feeling of hope and empowerment. That's I love that. That's, that's beautiful. So what, what other nuggets of wisdom can you give us from your book? Like in closing, um, as I said, folks need to read it. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, but what, what would you like to share with our listeners about like, I guess the thesis of your book or in summary, say. In summary, what the book is imparting in, wants to impart to the reader is you are a sovereign being. Stand up, Paul. It is time for you to stand in you, that power like you've never stood before because the forces of evil are coming for your soul. They're coming for it. It's your soul they're after. And it's time to recognize that. And, and to do that, you have to, you have to know what that is know what the soul really is and how valuable it is. I mean, if there's a force that is so determined to steal the soul out of the human race, it must be something pretty damn wonderful. And it's time for us. Oh, I'm gone. I've gone all neon here. <laughs> it's time for us to honor that, honor the soul that is who you are and recognize that it, you're immortal. That is the, the key. I really believe that is the key. Understanding immortality and recognizing the power of the soul. And nobody That's can beautiful. take it away from you. They can't hack you. Even though they say we're hackable animals, you have to let them in. So don't. Stand in your integrity. I hope we could do a part two to this because I have so many more questions and I appreciate your, your valuable time. Um, of course, like I said, I'll have everything running across the screen for folks so that they can reach out to you. If Can they do that if they have any questions? Do you, on your website, is there a contact me section? or? There is. And it, sometimes it takes me a little while to get back, but I try to answer everyone. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, thank you so much, Patricia. I really feel blessed to be able to connect with you and speak with you. Same here, and thank you for all the work you're doing as well. Thank you so much.